I've been following this young man. <laughs> and I say that uh, jokingly. I've been following this young man for the better part of my life. Um, being born and raised in New York and having this man who is synonymous with New York City and everything to do with some of the most high profile cases uh, that the country's ever seen. Please welcome world renowned American physician. Board certified pathologist, forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Barton. Dr. Thank Barton, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Good to talk to you. Oh, it's great to talk to you. I, I actually, I've been seeing you for so much of my life. I feel like I know you. <laughs> You're such a familiar face to me. Well, I've been around and I've been, uh, I was born in the Bronx, raised in Brooklyn live in Manhattan, so I've been all over the world, <laughs> all over the city. <laughs> all over the city, but everybody knows you. Okay, um, Dr. Barton, I got to ask you, you're, you're a world-renowned forensic pathologist. Have you always been fascinated with death? Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, Grow, I grew, growing up and growing up in, uh, in Brooklyn, in, in, in Fort Greene Projects in Brooklyn, um, uh, my mother always instilled in me that I should be a doctor. For whatever reason, she felt I should be a doctor. So I grew up with the idea of wanting to be a doctor to help living people, to take care of living people. And in those days, it was, Doctors used to make house calls. So when I was a kid and I had something uh, 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 wrong with me, uh, flu or, or something, a doctor would come to the house to, and and uh, check me out, and was very nice. And I was very impressed with that the the doctor. And um, as I grew up, I wanted to be a doctor, but I wanted to be a doctor to to do what normally what doctors do is treat living patients. Uh, it wasn't until I got into medical school that I became uh, interested in, death, in dead people. And that was just because I went, to, born in New York, went to City College, went to NYU Medical School, and at NYU Medical School at that time, uh, the autopsy room was in Bellevue Hospital. Uh, NYU was uh, in Bellevue, and and the morgue, the morgue um, was in the basement. And uh, in those days, we used to look at bodies and do dissections, anatomy uh, of. Uh, uh, people who had died and then were preserved in formaldehyde. And downstairs in the lobby, in, in the basement, was the medical, uh, where the Bellevue Hospital autopsy room was, was the medical examiner's office. And I used to go down there to see, uh, I went down there to, to see a, 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 a patient who died and was fascinated with the autopsies that were done down there. And that's what really got me interested in, uh, in, 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 how much can we learn from dead bodies? Wow. Uh, you know, we, we think back to uh, ancient Egypt, if you will, and they have these well-preserved mummies. Is that the earliest uh, that they were practicing forensic pathology, or has this practice of working on dead people been done since the beginning of time? I, I, I think uh, there's always been uh, religious and cultural interests in, in dead people, so that initially it was just after somebody died, especially a well-known person in the uh, community, 5,000 years ago, there might be special burial rites, and the Egyptians, are the ones we've gotten the most information about, had uh, had special uh, 
uh, embalming. They'd embalm bodies of the uh, pharaohs and all. Uh, and those pharaohs and all are still in pretty good c condition. Correct. I remember going down. I had to visit when I visited uh, 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 Egypt many, many years ago. And the museum, uh, the, the uh, main museum there, could see m mummies that had smallpox. And you can see the uh, smallpox lesions on the skin of mummies that were uh, uh, died 3,000, uh, 4,000 years ago. It was, they, they were very good in how to bury uh, people. Autopsies are more recent. Uh, the, the ability to learn from dead people uh, really developed in the 18, hundreds, 1850s, where autopsies began uh, seriously in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Berlin, Germany had uh, the, the uh, earliest real top uh, developed pathology was the, uh, and the ability to learn a great deal from the dead body. But uh, cultures, all cultures have been fascinated with the dead and had various rights, how to bury them, uh, how to preserve them, and it was just learning from them was really from the 19th century. Okay, um, taking this back, and I, I want to keep it uh, back in the early days of, of Egypt, if you will, because you spoke about that. You said that they were embalming the bodies back then, as we know. Are, are they using the same types of embalming fluids that we use Currently, or because obviously those bodies are relatively well preserved. Yeah, there are many well preserved bodies. They, they no, they used different kinds of uh, 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 plant uh, extracts, and um, uh, more. It, by the nineteenth century, uh, formaldehyde began to be used for bodies, and 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 that's what we still use uh, largely. Okay formaldehyde in various concentrations to, pre to preserve bodies. When you graduated NYU, New York City is in the middle of a heroin crisis, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, right. Okay. Was this point in your career, was it significant in terms of you? Because we all know you for um, so much of your getting people off who were thought to be guilty. Um, you've worked with a lot of the civil rights leaders um, over the years. It, police, they made it as though this heroin crisis was only a black and brown problem. And I know you saw it differently. Yeah, th that, you're absolutely right. Uh, when I graduated uh, from NYU Medical School, which was 19... 59, heroin addiction was se severe. And as I, in 1960, I got my uh, medical licensure and went, uh, became an intern resident at Bellevue Hospital. After I got my license, I started working uh, moonlighting for the medical examiner's office that was at NY in Bellevue Hospital where I worked. And I'd go out on house calls, uh, nights and weekends, do autopsies, uh, learn to do autopsies. And the biggest cause of death then on young people was heroin addiction, as you say. And it did strike the black community. Uh, there were more black deaths than, uh, than white deaths uh, or close to it at that time. The fl it's interesting, Sean, that the fentanyl deaths now going on are 10 times higher than we had in our crisis in the 1960s uh, when we had the heroin crisis in New York. We had maybe uh, a, a few thousand deaths a year was uh, uh, in the country. We had maybe 900 or 1,000 in New York City. Now there's 100,000 deaths uh, around the country, you know, just just by comparison. But we, it was the heroin crisis uh, was, was uh, uh, severe. It was interesting that you talk about uh, 
black and uh, uh, brown people. Uh, police, the police used to come into the medical, we're always coming in the medical examiner's office around the country to, to when they have cases they want to find the cause of death on. Uh, the police used to come down and uh, joke uh, about uh, how they would uh, stop people with heroin on. Mm -hmm. They had a condition they called dropsy. I mentioned in the book, I'm going to go through, dropsy. I, I said to the police officer, because he said, well, I saw this fellow uh, a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, we arrested him because he had dropsy, and then he got out, and he shot up again, and he died. Uh uh, so I said, what's, what's dropsy? There is a, a, there, an old condition, dropsy, that referred to swelling of the legs in people who had kidney disease or heart disease, uh, which uh, we now call uh, have different names for. So I said, that's a dro dropsy. He said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, uh, we stopped this guy, and uh, uh, we didn't have much to do with him, so we found a, a package of heroin right by his feet. He had dropped the heroin packet at his feet, so that's why we arrested him. And I said, um, uh, did he really have it? He said, no, we didn't have it. We have it. We dropped it for him, you know. And that Are was, you serious? Yeah. That, so I thought, now hear me out here, because I'm just a beginning medical examiner, and the book I— I tried to show how I evolved. Uh, it, it, my my work now with wrongful deaths, where uh, uh, w that you refer to, uh, when people who die and uh, either there's ro the uh, person is charged incorrectly or the police officer in many of the cases that I describe is. Uh, 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 has no charges against any police officers, like with uh, uh, Tyree Nichols. Uh, uh, they whatever they did, they caused the death, but nobody gets ever uh, gets charged with it. In, in my youth, when I first started out, uh, and I thought that isn't that very clever. The police, they they admit and they feel that that they had. Uh, 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 that this fellow had no heroin on him, but they arrested him because they found heroin that they planted at his at his feet, and they called it dropsy because he dropped it. Yeah, you know, uh, we tell the judge that he had it in his pocket, and we arrested him, and he tried to get rid of it and fell on the floor, and that's why on the ground. That's why we got him. Uh, so uh, uh, I thought it, my initial thing isn't that very clever. Later on, as I dealt more with drug addicts, and I saw how uh, the false arrests may be very, very uh, 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 popular way of, of uh, arresting people, that the arrest itself does immense harm to the uh, to the young man. From then on, he has an arrest record and is limited in what he can do and what jobs he can get. Correct. So uh, it, 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 initially, uh, I was inducted into being a medical examiner as uh, uh, being part of the medical examiner's uh, prosecution team. They had it. Uh, uh, when I be first became a medical examiner after finishing my residency at Bellevue, uh, I was. Uh, brought into a meeting with the chief medical examiner, with the, uh, the uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, homicide division of the district attorney's office, and um, uh, was told, hey, you know, prosecution are a, um, uh, a, a three-legged stool. It, re it, it requires the uh, police, the prosecutor, the the, uh, the district attorney and the medical examiners working as a team, and so and this is the way most medical examiners start out, and it takes a while to realize that we can't be team players. That if the medical the medical examiner is there not to support one side or another to give whatever the the scientific evidence is on how somebody dies, uh, and if um, uh, if we disagree with the uh, uh, the um, uh, opinion and the uh, of the prosecutor, uh, we have to uh, 
say that, hey, he didn't die the way you said. He didn't die charging at a police officer who shot him. He died the way the witnesses said, shot in the back while he was running away. And we got that, those kind of cases that uh, we can't say that somebody died the way that's supportive of the uh, theory of the of the charges of the prosecutor. If I'm not uh, yeah. saying this in clear enough form, you know, I, I, I'm literally stunned listening to you. Uh, Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned dropsy, and and I was blown away that police officers would be so cavalier, uh, and even disclosing to uh, you're the medical examiner, but to to even say no, he didn't drop it. We dropped it for him. It, it, that that's insane. I mean, obviously, uh. Myself being an African-American man, we know that this goes on in the community um, all too well. Um, but, but just to think that police would would be so open about it. And then secondarily, uh, the thought was <clears throat> the medical examiner, the prosecutor and the police. They, it's a team. And I. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just think what you said was just so powerful and um, it brings to light so much of what we already know has been going on behind the scenes for so many years. Yeah, I think I think the, a great deal of the problem is that as I started out, I was a Jewish kid in the Fort Greene projects all by myself and there were gangs and all and uh, I learned very much that I was an outsider with, with, where I grew up because there were very few Jewish cha Jewish uh, families there. Uh, I had a friend, my best friend was a black fellow, Justice Taylor, who uh, uh, went to school together and we were both outsiders. We were both outsiders that uh, uh, in the, in the community that we lived in. Um, when I came into the medical examiner's office it began, and uh, were a, dealt with a lot of police, it was, and this is New York City, it was clear that the reason there were so many more black people in jails and prisons uh, than the population would suggest uh, was that there was and there is a concern that there's a higher rate, we were told, a higher rate of bad people. The, 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 the bad people are in prison and we're the good people. The, the police and the prosecutors uh, and the medical examiner working to get the, the bad people in prison. And that part of the reason that all there are more bad uh, uh, people in prison is because of the way the, the legal system works and the way that uh, uh, that in the projects there are uh, not enough ways to get out into the real world, and they get arrested more not for not because they're doing bad things necessarily, but with the dropsy situation because the police think they're bad to begin with. So if they see a kid on a bicycle or something that uh, doing bad things and he doesn't stop, especially if they don't stop immediately, if they say stop, uh, there'll be ways in which to to uh, arrest them and they get into, uh, and we as medical examiners see more dead uh, uh people of black and brown color for many reasons uh, other than um, uh, other than natural conditions. Natural conditions work, uh, there's no problem, but in, in the medical examiner world where we see accidents, suicides, homicides, um, a lot more uh, uh, people of color than uh, the population would indicate, and it's not necessarily because, and it definitely isn't because they're born bad as as uh, uh, the attitude is that uh, black people are born badder than white people. That's why they get more into trouble with the police. And uh, that's just uh, uh, 
Uh, initially, it's easy to believe that because we see uh, the police arresting more black people, but uh, uh, it's, there are other reasons uh, other than behavior that gets them, uh, that we as medical examiners do more autopsies on black people. Wow. Wow. Um, you mentioned police, prisons, uh I know one of your earlier high-profile cases, and this goes back to the early 70s, um, the Attica uprising. You and Dr. Henry Siegel were called in to re-examine the bodies of the hostages. And um, you concluded that the nine hostages, which were p policemen, correctional officers, they were hit with bullets from friendly fire when the police stormed Attica Correctional Facility to take it back. And those bodies didn't have knife wounds. They weren't dead already. They were actually caught in the middle of that crossfire. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. It was it was nine uh, nine workers. They were mostly uh, correction officers. Yep. Who were shot? There were 40, 43 people died. It was actually eleven finally died. Two people died later on uh, in in the hospital. So there were forty three deaths altogether when the police retook Attica back around nineteen seventy one, and. Um, uh, uh, 11, uh, 32, 32 were inmates who were, who were shot, uh, by the police. The not, the, the non inmates, the, the hostages were, had been blindfolded and were standing in a, in a back area, uh, uh the ones who were shot, um, and were blindfolded, and they thought that that would prevent the guards from retaking it. And in the shooting, they were shot, most of them by buckshot. Uh, uh, inadvertently, they, that somebody, one of the uh, 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 police officers, shot at a, um, a prisoner and missed, and the buckshot went into this group of um uh, 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 of uh, double O buckshot in a group uh, of um, uh, guards, and uh, nine of them died with bullet, with buckshot in the head because that buckshot contained about twelve pellets, twelve double O buckshot pellets, each one the size of a thirty two caliber gun, and uh, killed uh, killed uh, the prisoners. When the prisoners were taken out. The blindfolds had come down over the neck, and and the blood. Uh, there was bloody blindfolds over the neck, and the me the media were told that that's because the they the guard that the prisoners had cut their necks. The media immediately ran with that, including the New York Times. That the lead story was uh, the hostages' necks were cut by the by the uh, inmates. Uh, the medical examiner in Buffalo uh, saw the bodies and initially said to the, to the press, "No, they were fire. They died from friendly fire." The the uh, commissioner of uh, uh, the uh, prison system was outraged that we all saw that their necks were cut. That this guy is lying. The the Buffalo medical examiner. Was, was, was not telling the truth, and they wanted an outside independent expert to come up to, to re-examine the bodies. And that's how I got called from New York City. I was the medical examiner, a deputy medical examiner in New York City. I came up and uh, uh, to examine the bodies and re-examined all of the, uh, f uh, the 35, about 38 bodies, most of the, almost all the bodies uh, of, uh, of, the, of the prisoner, of the guards, uh, but I also insisted that I had to look at the prisoners also, because many of them were not shot the way the way they were shot. Some in the back and all uh, that. Um, uh, the um, uh, when I, and I, and I confirmed that the first medical examiner, who said that the um, 
uh, this the, that none of the none of the uh, guards were killed by the inmates. They were all killed by um, uh, by uh, friendly fire, and uh, uh, that uh, the the medical examiner in Buffalo was harassed because he had uh, blamed the uh, the uh, police and uh, not the uh, inmates uh, up in Buffalo. But in New York City, they 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 were kinder to me when I agreed with him. Mm hmm. Wow. Okay. Um. By the way, was that your first really high profile case that you worked on? Uh, uh it would be the 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 most uh, high profile. Uh, yes, in nineteen seventy one, it was the most high. We had. A, a number of deaths in the city of famous people who died, and there'd be newspaper articles. In those days, in those days, the press had uh, people in the medical examiner's office. You know, police reporters who would come mm -hmm. every day to the medical examiner's office, and there was a lot of uh, interest in the fit. We had. Uh, Sean, you're too young to remember this. When I was starting out, there were 15 dailies, 15 newspaper dailies in the five boroughs of New York. Uh, and they, uh, uh, there was a great deal of interest in those days in the different papers uh, for um, uh, 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 deaths, people who, who died. So at that time, they would be local newspaper stories about whichever medical examiner uh, would would uh, have done an autopsy on a famous person. There'd be a write-up and there'd be a little bit of publicity about medical examiners. But this was the first really national story that I was involved with. Yeah. Uh, in the late 70s, you were the chief medical examiner for the city of New York. Right. You were ultimately removed from the position. Um, from then, Mayor Koch, after he received complaints about your work and memos from, um, at that time, District Attorney Robert Margenthal and um, Ronaldo Ferrer. And you later won a wrongful termination suit for something to the tune of $100,000. Is that correct? Yeah. Why do you think they came after you? Well, it was clear. What, what happened was when I became chief medical examiner in, in 1978, um, I explained to the staff that uh, uh, we can't be partial, more, more partial to the prosecutors than to the uh, defense attorneys, that we had to be equally available to both. We had one death that came out uh, in Brooklyn of a black businessman named Arthur Miller. He was uh, well known in the community. He was a businessman. He did a lot of things uh, for the. Uh, uh, he was very friendly with police. He had a a, a um, uh, permit to have a, a handgun, which. Uh, because uh, of his various uh, businesses, and he was a community, he was a community activist. Um, he comes home one day, uh, Arthur Miller, and uh, uh, when he gets to his house, he sees a crowd around his brother. He had a brother who was a hard worker who was who made who was taking trash at, uh, from the bu a building at night after hours or something. And the police came uh, to uh, uh, to arrest him because he wasn't he shouldn't be doing what he was doing at that time. Uh, he, he doing uh, and he uh, there's a crowd around him. He comes there and he says to the police, uh, 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 gathering the crowd, holds his hand on his hands up, saying to police, "Hey, he's my brother." Uh, he, uh, the crowd should stop. He tells the crowd to stop. The police, though, see the gun that he has and don't know him, the two policemen, and they run over and they drag him down and drag him to the police car. And he winds up saying, I can't breathe, goes to the police car, comes out at the um, precinct, and he's dead. It becomes a medical examiner's case. Uh, the the medical examiner in Brooklyn, 
uh, does the autopsy, and I uh, uh, speak to him by phone uh, from Manhattan, my uh, chief medical examiner's desk. And I say, what you find? He said, I, I found uh, neck compression. I found uh, 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 little uh, drops, uh, blood drops in his eyes. Uh, and I said, and what, uh, what's the cause of death? Uh, he says, uh, well, uh, psychosis with exhaustion. I say, what do you mean psychosis with exhaustion? Uh, he says, well, uh, that's the way we were taught to sign these cases out when police die in, while being subdued by police because they're exhausted with all the uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, struggle that's going on. And I say, wait a second, I, uh, hold on. I went down there. I found the hemorrhage in the neck. I found there were injuries to the, uh, to the bar, larynx and the windpipe. And I say, this is a classic case of uh, neck compression of dying because he was strangled. He, that uh, by the way the police choked him, choking death, uh, when they removed him from uh, into their car uh, during the struggle. And I insisted we put down um, cause of death strangulation during police uh, 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 restraint homicide for the case. Well, that apparently got the police department very upset at me because in the old days, it would be called psychosis with exhaustion was his fault, and that was the end of it. And that's the kind of problem lots of other medical examiners have around the country and with George Floyd uh, uh, is that uh, uh, the causes of death uh, there's a, a, a current uh, uh, sequel to psychosis with exhaustion is excited delirium is a common, is not a common, is a, a cause of death that's given by some medical examiners to, to uh, people who die while being uh, uh, restrained, uh, who can't breathe. The choking, the back pressure causes asphyxia so the person can't breathe. Well, that was a case that uh, the um, uh, meta that uh, Mayor Koch said, well, I shouldn't have said that it was the poli police fault in that case uh, because uh, that could cause the uh, uh, people to, uh, uh, to have a, uh, a, a riot or something. And I said, no, well, we called it the way it was, that it was and they didn't, there was no riot afterwards. The, uh, the community settled down when they saw that they got the correct police, but uh, the correct um, uh, diagnosis was made that it was caused by police choking him. Uh, but also he said, well, may, uh, my uh, district attorney Morgenthau says that you're not cooperative enough with his uh, in, in uh, accepting his theories of the case. You know, that when they uh, that uh, there were other cases where uh, uh, there was somebody who uh, was arrested for uh, for um, uh, strangling a, a woman to death. There's a, a, a murder, a homicide in which a person is uh, uh, strangled somebody and the person died. Then. Uh, but the, the theory of the case was that he had also raped her, that he had raped her. I said, no, there was no evidence of rape. We can't say that. And uh, the district attorney, Morgenthau, told Koch that, well, I'm not, I'm not a team player. I'm not a team player, which, which I didn't want to be a team player. I, I had, by that time, when I became chief, realized that we are not part of the three-legged stool. We're independent of the... Uh, we're giving the scientific evidence, and we're not there just to confirm what the police and prosecution think the cause of death is. And those were uh, among the reasons, uh, the, uh, the two main reasons why uh, why uh, I was demoted. Uh, Koch demoted me uh, because, uh, largely because of the Arthur Miller case. And the fact that the may, the one mayor, the the other four, the other four uh, district attorneys all said, "Yeah, we want him to be independent," uh, but not Cot, uh, not uh, Morgenthau. Morgenthau and and Cot said, "Well, Morgenthau is the most important district attorney, so he demoted me." He said, "Look, he, he said what he demoted me. You're a great medical examiner, nothing to do with your ability, but you're not a team player." 
what percentage of medical examiners would you say then and now operate as quote unquote team players? Well, Sean, very interesting. There are about maybe 500 uh, forensic pathologists around there. There's a shortage of forensic pathologists. Among when George Floyd died, to, 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 and everybody saw what he died on video in the in in the videos that were taken by the bystanders. Right, um, as soon as the autopsy was finished, the prosecutor and I go through this in the book. The prosecutor made an announcement that the autopsy found there was no evidence that the restraint by the police had anything to do with his death. And that he did have evidence of drug abuse and he did have evidence of heart disease. Uh, the family, and uh, again, uh, uh, Ben Crump was the lawyer for the family, was outraged by it. They saw that this was not a drug overdose and this wasn't heart disease. Uh, and the way he died and the way he was calling out 20 times or so for, for I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And that's why, why uh, Crump again called me to come down there to do his second autopsy. Uh, in, in the, um, uh, and I and uh, a, 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 very, a very excellent uh, forensic pathologist, uh, 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 Dr. Wilson, uh, uh, did a second autopsy, and we confirmed absolutely that this was a uh, death due to, asphy due to asphyxia on the second autopsy, uh, that the restraint caused his death. The, medical, the, the, the National Association of Medical Examiners, for which uh, is, the, is, the big, is what most forensic pathologists uh, belong to, came out with a statement saying that the first autopsy is more important than the second autopsy and is more reliable, and that you can't rely on uh, medical examiners who are hired by the family to do a second autopsy, okay? So if we hadn't gone and done a second autopsy, there would have been a few months delay before the final cause of death was, uh, uh, would have been uh, issued. Uh, and uh, uh, George Floyd's case would have just disappeared in part be, as many others except for the community upset that uh, had already been raised. If not, uh, Sean, if not for those photographs taken by a fifth 17-year-old girl yep, that showed yep. that showed the uh, the horror and the joy the horror of the incident and the joy of the of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, uh, police officer uh, uh, that that uh, would have uh, the, the medical examiner would have been a long time before issuing some kind of a statement uh, about cause of death uh, at, that would confirm that the restraint had nothing to do with it. Hmm. You know, you you mentioned something, and I got to ask you this because you you're always bought in, um, for lack of a better way to put it, a, a, a second opinion. Families call you in to do a second autopsy independently. Are the results of a second autopsy as good and as reliable as the original autopsy? That's a great that's a great question, and thank you because that that needs explanation. It's always best to to be able to do the first autopsy and to see what see the findings then the advantage of a second autopsy is we often have more information than the first autopsy by the time the autopsy and the first autopsy uh, the police are still working on the families may may not have been interviewed properly to, to find out the backstory of what happened uh, and uh, whether, what illnesses the person may or may not have had. So 
uh, although uh, the first autopsy is better, should be better than the second, uh, the second autopsy, we know more of what the issues are. We know wh why, uh, say with George Floyd, we knew there was a concern about the neck, uh, a knee on the neck that caused compression of the uh, uh, blood, blood vessels in the neck. Uh, that were on the video, and we were able to find hemorrhage uh, present um, uh, uh, in the in the uh, uh, neck muscles that were not seen in the first autopsy. That confirmed that there was a lot of pressure on the neck. Uh, but um, uh, the issues there are um, uh, most of the time we do a second autopsy. Uh, it confirms what the first person did, but not with the police uh, uh, deaths. That is, most of second autopsies are done because of uh, uh, natural conditions that may have caused death, or that families did did don't believe that it's suicide when when the uh, medical examiner said so. And we do second autopsies and find uh, that usually the the, the um, first autopsy was correct. But that's it, the, the autopsies on people dying while restrained by police uh, turn out to be um, uh, a lot of those are not confirmed by the second autopsy, uh, partly because the main w w way that people die during confrontations with police one is shooting because the police officer says, uh, uh, I felt threatened or he was running away and he shoots the person. The cause of death is clear at uh, the shooting. And then the issue becomes not a medical examiner's issue, but uh, did the, per did the uh, police officer do what he was supposed to do? Uh, did, uh, did, uh, did, was the deviation in what the police officer had done? Was the, f was the shooting justifiable? That's not the medical examiner's issue. That's the, 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 I think even more than the shooting deaths are the deaths during restraint. Uh, George Floyd, Eric Garner, uh, uh, and, and hundreds of deaths that don't get the spotlight. That uh, you're, you're down in, uh, in Florida, in Louisiana, down in Louisiana. Um, uh, Green, there's a, a, a deaths of uh, 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 Green uh, just recently, a couple of years ago, in which uh, um, who uh, was being stopped by a um, was being for a traffic violation. Uh, he's in his forties. He didn't stop right away, and he ran. And he ran. They ran after him. Not ran. They uh, he rode. He kept riding. Police chased him. He crashed into some bushes. The autopsy, an autopsy was done. The family was given a death certificate that said uh, automobile, cause of death, automobile crash, uh, accident. Two years later, when they were able to get a hold of the video, it showed that when he stopped, he immediately said, I'm sorry to the police. They pulled him out of the car, tased him, pepper sprayed him, beat him up like uh, Ty -Nickel Tyree Nichols was, uh, 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 handcuffed him, shackled his legs, and uh, sat on his back. And he died of uh, asphyxia. He couldn't breathe. Because the family got a lawyer and went in, and went in far enough to get the videos two years later, they find that out. But if that were looked for in the uh, in, uh, uh, in trying to find uh, do a, a, a search uh, by death certificates for people who died 
uh, during police encounters would never be found because it was just an automobile crash on a death certificate. So that um, the what what uh, I found, what I would find, say uh, uh, two years later, who didn't do the autopsy, uh, but I found material. I was sent material by a lawyer. Uh, the doctor, the doing the autopsy, didn't even know about it at that time. They hadn't seen uh, the videotape. But they knew that he had been uh, uh, pepper sprayed, tased, beaten up, uh, and um, uh, it was he didn't die because of the auto crash. The auto crash had nothing to do with it. But uh, in the coroner system, the doctor doesn't make the, the determination. It's the coroner who's elected, as opposed to medical examiners who do do the autopsy. So that a lot of cases are like, the Green case in which um, you can't tell from the death certificate any any information about uh, the um, uh, police um, restraint. And I think, unfortunately, uh, that uh, even if the uh, uh, medical examiner knows uh, uh, what the true cause of death is, it doesn't necessarily go on the death certificate. And in most cases, are not as violent as green. In most cases, when people die while being subdued by police, and most of these people, most uh, more than half, I think, are acute uh, psychotic, uh, uh, acute mental hill, mental it, problems that the person should be brought to an emergency room where somebody's running around nude in the street because he didn't take his. Uh, 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 schizophrenic med medication, or right. or because he's high on some drug uh, uh, like uh, uh, methamphetamine or something, uh, running around cause, uh, uh, causing a uh, a nuisance, knocking on doors, nude sometimes. Police are called instead of bringing the person to the hospital. Uh, they just say, "Hey, uh, put your hands behind your back." Uh, so I can handcuff you, which is what police nor normally do. If the person is so out of it, uh, he may not understand what the police officer is telling him. This is a mental health crisis, and it would be better if there were a mental health worker with the police on these calls. They know in advance that it's EDP, emotionally disturbed person, there should be a mental health worker coming with the police, as some jurisdictions are now trying to do, to deal with the, sick, the mentally ill people who don't understand what the police do, who get frightened by the police uniforms. And uh, the police then uh, as now bring the person down to the ground so that they can put the handcuffs on his back from behind. And during the compression of the back, putting a knee in the back to get the wrists together in somebody who's struggling, is when the intestines are pushed upwards the diaphragm is pushed up, and w w while I'm talking to you, Sean, our uh, diaphragms are going up about 15 times a minute as we inhale and uh, exhale, inhale and exhale. If there's enough pressure on our back that pushes the intestines upward and the liver upward, the diaphragms can't go down. Uh, in order for us to breathe, as we're breathing, the diaphragms go down to suck air into the lungs. Uh, when the diaphragms don't go down, the person trying to inhale can't, and that's why he says, I can't breathe. He says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, because he can't inhale. And the police have the, uh, mis, uh, uh, the uh, inaccurate information that if you say, I can't breathe, that means you're, that means you're breathing. They, if, if, uh, while I'm Correct. talking Correct. to you right now, I'm not breathing right now while I'm talking, and I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. Uh, that uh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Uh, uh, Eric Gardner couldn't breathe. I, uh, uh, George, George Floyd couldn't breathe. Uh, and uh, the person dies because he can't breathe because there's not enough oxygen going to his brain. He passes out. The handcuffs are then put on, and suddenly they realize that, that he's not breathing. He doesn't have a pulse because there's not enough oxygen in his system. And this is called by many of my colleagues, unfortunately, still uh, excited delirium, 
uh, and not asphyxia by asphyxia homicide, excited delirium natural. Understood. Hmm. Uh, I, I, the boss of bosses, the boss of all bosses, um, to switch subjects, Carmen Galante, um, he was the protege of Vito Genovese and Joe Bonanno. Mob figure right here in New York City. Died by shooting while having lunch in Brooklyn. Did you do the original autopsy on his body or were you called in to do the autopsy after the fact? And if so, why? Well, uh, no, no, he was uh, the head, the, one of the heads of, of the f five families, uh, the mafia families that in the 1970s uh, that controlled a lot of crime in, uh, in New York. And he was at lunch. He had, he had made his mark in uh, one of the mafia families uh, by bringing in a lot of heroin from Canada into, into New York, into New York City. Uh, so he had, the mafia made a lot of money on uh, the, the heroin trade. Uh, and uh, he was shot uh, while at lunch uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, and it was interesting because two of the, he was there with uh, about five people. Two of the guards who were supposed to protect him were not shot by the uh, people who came into the restaurant killed Galante plus the two other people, and those two other people apparently were were in on the shooting. Were in on the shooting uh, of Galante. He uh, there was a, a photograph of him with the cigar still in his mouth. Correct, correct. Uh, as I recall, which I saved for the museum. The, the the we had the cigar in the New York City Medical Examiner's Museum at the time, which is closed down now. Uh, but uh, what happened was uh, I, uh, the medical examiner from Brooklyn, would handle the case, and I came down there to uh, to uh, make at the time of the autopsy to make sure that uh, uh, there were no problems with the case. So, but it was handled by the Brooklyn medical examiner. Okay, when you say no problems with the case, because cases like that, it seems pretty open and shut to me. You know, he's having lunch and he was shot. There's no d dispute there. Right, right. Uh, yeah, what was happening, though, the, uh, and you're absolutely right, there's no dispute, but it, it, it got a lot of publicity immediately. Uh, so in the shooting cases, as there, there was a, a shotgun, and I think in two handguns, the, the issues in those cases, uh, uh, like with Malcolm X, which I uh, was around for, uh, uh, came in for, uh, the uh, the number of uh, uh, we had to make sure that all the bullets are recovered, because uh, uh, the the bullet that's left behind could be the bullet from an additional weapon that wasn't known of, uh, known. In the shooting cases, the the bullets are important because that tells you uh, what weapon it came from, and then the police are able to hook up the weapon to the person who who shot who did the shooting, and uh, is an important part of the uh, district attorney's case. Even though, as you say, the cause of death is pretty obvious. The cause of death immediately is obvious with shooting. The the, the cause of death isn't obvious with the uh, restraint deaths with the people who die because they can't breathe. Because, uh, Sean, one of the things about the, uh, the dying from inability to breathe, from compression, just compression of the neck or compression of the back, is it doesn't leave any marks on the body. Often, there, there, there aren't any marks on the body to show you that there was a knee on the back, for example, and he couldn't breathe. And that's why it's important to know that the autopsy starts at the scene of death. The scene of death in, um, in uh, the Floyd case tells you what was happening uh, in the um, uh, restraint and the visuals, the, the photographs that were taken uh, document the scene. 
the autopsy doesn't show any. Uh, the, by the time you go to autopsies, the, the check, there's no chest compression anymore. There's not even any neck compression anymore. There was a little hemorrhage in the neck that we found in the second autopsy. But uh, in general, um, uh, cutting off breathing by pressing on the back, which is what happens during handcuffing a person who's resisting, uh, doesn't show up at the autopsy, uh, but it does show up at the uh, at the um, uh, uh, photographs, at the scene photo. That's why the vi videos are so important in these cases. And with with the uh, with the t uh, with the Nichols matter, uh, uh, it's it, there was a photograph, a video, uh, Tyrese. Uh, we've seen what happened to him from a poll video. Uh, the Memphis police had poll videos in addition to the body cams. The body cam of Tyree Nichols being um, uh, beaten up don't show very much because they're very close. But the the poll video, which is uh, not which is unusual. It, shows the whole scene and shows how he, he was being kicked or punched and kicked, which doesn't show up on the on the uh, body cams. And even though body cams are helpful, often, as with Tyree, uh, some of the officers don't put them on. You know, they got to put them on to work. And uh, uh, so you don't get all the officers who uh, were involved. And what one of the things we should learn from the Tyree Nichols is that videos higher up that get a broader look at what was going on became much more important in showing the amount of uh, uh, the way he was uh, beaten up. You know, uh, we spoke about video. We we spoke about. Uh, I I made the statement that uh, shooting deaths are, are, are pretty cut and dry, which we know that they're not. Um, but one case that you were involved in, uh, it really shows that you can have something on video. You can have the person dying due to gunshot wound and there are still more questions than answers. And in this case, I'm talking about JFK, um, you served as chairman of the, of the house select committee on assassinations forensic pathology panel that investigated that assassination. It is now 2023. This is still one of America's great conspiracies. Why is there a conspiracy to begin around this case? That is a very, also a very good uh, question. Uh, back in the, uh, uh, 1978. I hadn't been. Uh, I was still. I was still deputy chief medical examiner. Uh, the uh, U.S. Congress decided to set up, a, a, a created a um, um, uh, a special select committee on assassinations. Select committee on assassinations to investigate the deaths of President John F. Kennedy and of Dr. Martin Luther King because there were controversies whether the initial investigations were accurate. With John F. Kennedy, uh, and in both, in, in both deaths, uh, their, uh, the cause of death were, uh, were clear, the, uh, the rifle wounds. The, uh, but the issues were... Uh, how many shooters were there with John F. Kennedy? Because, because when John F. Kennedy comes into the hospital and then he's in the emergency room, uh, the doctor examining him sees a bullet hole in the neck. The first doctor, and the first thing they do is make a decision through the bullet hole in the neck uh, to put a, 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 a trachea. A trachea tracheostomy and shizen, to put an airway in the, in the neck so he can breathe. Uh, he dies. He goes, television comes in and says that he was shot in the neck. He was shot from the front. Uh, one shooter. The body is illegally moved 
to Washington. It should have been done by uh, the autopsy by the medical examiner in Dallas, who is very, uh, who is very uh, experienced. It goes to Dallas, where the bo- doctors doing the autopsies are a naval uh, physician, naval pathologist. Uh, they uh, they don't call and speak to the uh, uh, doctor in Dallas, say, what did you do? What kind of incisions did you make or anything? Uh, they don't do that, which a normal medical examiner would do. They turn the body over and see a bullet hole in the back. They see a bullet hole in the back, uh, uh, in addition to the wound in the head, in the back. And um, they say he was shot in the back. And they think that the uh, they don't realize there's an exit hole in the front because the tracheotomy incision. So the doctors in Bethesda say he, he was shot twice, the, 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 gun, the gunshot wound in the head, and he was also shot in the back. The, um, P, the doctors in Dallas say he shot in the head, but he's also shot in the neck. So if you have a shooting in the front and a shooting in the back, that's two shooters. And they start out right away with two shooters, a conspiracy, and uh, that has burgeoned into an industry where there are a lot of people who think that there were multiple shooters, that it was conspiracy. But we found from the autopsy point of view that he, President Kennedy was shot twice, two, uh, two uh, 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 entrances in, in, the, in the back uh, fought by, uh, uh, from uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and uh, no bullet wounds from the front, whereas uh, other, others to this day will say, well, the two shooters, the conspiracy, they haven't released all yet. There's still some uh, uh, records that haven't been released yet. Why are they holding on to it? And that there were, it was a conspiracy because there were two shooters. Mm. Okay, so... To set the record straight, there is no conspiracy. Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter, and he was shot twice. Yeah, Lee Harvey Oswald actually uh, shot three three bullet three times. Two of them hit the president, uh, and they, and those are the two bullets: one in the back of the head, and one in the uh, ba- upper back of the president, and that caused his death. It, it really. Uh, he died of the bullet wound of the of the uh, head, uh, the the wound of the head. He pr- he probably he would have survived uh, if it was only the one shot in the back. Okay, um, you mentioned that you were um, that you served as the deputy medical examiner for Suffolk County. Yes. Okay, you were dim- dismissed from that position, but it was later rescinded. What what happened with that? No, I, I took a, uh, uh, after I was demoted in 1979 uh, from um, um, uh, being chief medical examiner, I was demoted by Mayor Koch to, uh, from chief medical examiner to deputy chief medical examiner. Uh, a year or two later, I decided to take a two-year sabbatical. I took a sabbatical uh, uh, which I was entitled to for two years because the medical examiner in um, Suffolk County, Dr. Weinberg, uh, needed some assistance there. So I came out there. I was deputy chief. I was an acting chief for a little while when he had to go to the hospital. And uh, at the end of the sabbatical, I um, uh, came back to New York City as, um, as uh, deputy chief medical examiner. Okay, okay. Got you. Um, You also, in the early 90s, you did an autopsy for civil rights leader Mega Evers. Mega Evers was shot and killed in 1963. His body was in the ground at that point for something like 28 years. Number one... Is it ever too long? Because I have to imagine bringing someone out of the ground almost 30 years later. What did we find in there? Hey, is it ever a- too long to do an autopsy? And, and can you get anything that is reliable that many years later? Uh, 
You're right on, uh, Sean. Um, uh, while I was in Suffolk County, the two years I was in Suffolk County, uh, in 1981 or 82, and, and the, the, the two years I was in Suffolk County, I got a call from Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran calls me. I didn't know him. And he was just starting out uh, as an attorney in, in Los Angeles. And he said, look, uh, there was a, a, a shooting uh, death, uh, not a shooting, there was a death of, uh, uh, huh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Sean, I'm going to Ron Settles, this part gotcha. of it, yeah, uh, do you have time for that? I could go through Ron Settles and then get sure. to Medgar Evers. Sure. Yeah, because... Uh, uh, so while the, the continuing Suffolk County, I, I have the the the, de the death of Ron settles. Is that how I met uh, Johnny Cochran? And uh, uh, at that time, uh, Johnny Cochran said he had a death. There was a dispute as to whether Ron settles committed suicide in a prison in uh, out in, Lo in Los Angeles area and. Uh, the family uh, wants an autopsy, and he's buried in uh, in uh, in uh, Tennessee. Uh, could you do a second autopsy? And this is uh, about a year later with Johnny Cochran. We exhumed that body, and we're able to find uh, uh, that uh, uh, he had been uh, he didn't commit suicide by hanging. Uh, with Medgar Evers, going back to Medgar Evers. Um, when I was, while I was medical, uh, while I was working with the New York State Police, after leaving New York City in 1985, I became the chief forensic pathologist for the New York State Police. And one of the things we did there, uh, Dr. Lowell Levine and I became uh, uh, directors of the New York State, uh, State Police uh, unit on uh, 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 forensic science uh, uh, area, and um, we set up a an annual homicide conference that people came from uh, uh, across the United States, uh, including people from Mississippi. The people from Mississippi asked us to come down to lecture to them in Biloxi in their annual conference. Uh, came down there. Uh, and the de when I finished the lecture in Biloxi, uh, the um, uh, chief prosecutor in um, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, asked uh, they needed some assistance with the death of Medgar Evers, who had been uh, uh, who was shot in nine, in um, uh, in 1963. In 19, a civil rights leader in 1963, uh, that they had evidence that the prosecutor now had evidence 28 years later uh, that um, uh, concerning uh, the person who did the shooting of uh, Medgar Evers. The problem is they didn't have the, uh, an autopsy report uh, of it. They had found the weapon, they found the owner of the weapon. And um, uh, they didn't have the autopsy. They, they needed a good, uh, didn't have a proper cause of death. So we explained to I explained to the uh, prosecutor that um, uh, exhumations can uh, give a lot of information on um, uh, bullet wounds because bullets uh, uh, the bone stays intact for hundreds of years. The, the soft tissues in the body usually deteriorates. And um, that from a medical examiner's point of view, uh, burial is long-term storage, that we can exhume the body and find the bullet tract uh, that struck bone. So that's why as... Uh, 
the chief forensic pathologist for New York State Police, I, uh, the police, state police in New York agreed that they could bring the body up to the New York State, uh, to our office in Albany, uh, and that I would uh, uh, do a, a re-examination now. It's 28 years later. And the coffin was brought up uh, from Arlington Cemetery. Medgar Evers uh, had uh, been in the military in World War II, still when it was segregated. You know, but when he was uh, buried, they buried, he was buried in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, the body was brought up to uh, uh, the New York State Police uh, 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 for uh, my uh, re-examination. And uh, when we opened up the casket, the the body of Medgar Evers, 28 years after burial, was in perfect condition. Uh, he had been wow. buried. Uh, we tried to track it out. He'd been buried uh, in Arlington Cemetery, sort of at a little hillside, uh, a little uh, elevation, a little elevation. So whatever happened, we opened the casket. No water had gotten into the casket. The casket, the water is what causes the deterioration of a body most quickly, be it underwater uh, or rainwater. Uh, uh, no water had gotten into his casket. Uh, he was His son, he had a, a three-year-old son who wanted to be there to see his, his father, uh, who 30 years later now, uh, because he has no memory of his dad. So he had come up, and we'd agreed that uh, uh, what he, what probably the body was probably in skeletal condition, so it wouldn't be in a, he wouldn't be able to see the body, but we'd see any kind of clothing. He he had been in the he had various um, he was a mason, some he had masonic material, or he had uh, in the casket that we'd show whatever was in the casket with him. And uh, when we opened the casket uh, in Albany, he was in, it was as if he had been buried uh, uh, a, a few days before. He would, we were able to set things up so that it was uh, like at a funeral parlor where the son could come in to see his dad. And he could see his dad. He was the same age as his dad was when his dad was shot. Uh, just uh, remarkable to, to see the son identify Van, V-A-N, uh, his dad, to see his dad that he had never, had no memory of. Uh, and then we were able to do a full autopsy and the photographs of his father, of Medgar Evers in the casket, showing him uh, as if he had died just a few days before, turned out to be very, that, that we took, turned out to be very valuable at the time of the uh, trial because jurors said later that when we showed them, when I showed them the photographs and the bullet holes, uh, were able to identify where he was shot, um, they say he would look like a, a real person, not like his a historical thing. He, th this wasn't a historical old kind of uh, thing to remember. They could see him as a real human being in the photographs. And um, he had been shot uh, once in the back, and we were able to trace the bullet, uh, the bullet going through the body, uh, uh, and uh, testify to the uh, trial that um, uh, uh, to the to the jury uh, the, of how he was shot in the back and how it went through his lung uh, and exited. The the, the uh, prosecutor. Uh, was Bobby DeLauder was the uh, de was the deputy chief uh, uh, prosecutor who, who was there at the time of the autopsy uh, couldn't locate the bullet. The first in the, there had been two trials earlier at the time of the shooting uh, in 1963, uh, or near uh, a few months di uh, before President Kennedy was shot. Um, the um, and the uh, um, uh, district attorney at the time was able to arrest uh, the shooter. He went to trial, and there were two hung juries, 
two hung juries in in um, uh, the first trial. That's why it was still an open case. If there was a not guilty verdict, as there were in most of the uh, death cases, uh, the lynchings and all, or uh, causes of death uh, uh, it, it, during the civil rights days, uh, if there been uh, if there was a, uh, uh, a not guilty verdict, uh, then um, that's the end of the case. They can be tried again because there were two hung juries. Uh, it was still an open case, and uh, that's why the exhumation was important. I testified. Uh, and th after I testified, I had the same question you asked me. How, why was the body in such good condition? And I found the funeral home in Jackson where the body had been uh, uh, embalmed, uh, had, had been buried. And I, and I uh, went in there, and there was an old timer there. When I asked him uh, about, do you remember a case 30 years? This is 30 years now after the trial. Uh, Medgar Evers, he said, of course I remember that. that was the, uh, the most famous case we ever had. And I said, uh, he's in excellent, excellent condition. Can you tell me how he was embalmed? He said, well, in those days, 1963, we didn't have refrigeration. Now bodies are refrigerated. We didn't have a refrigeration. Uh, so what we used to do, because there are a lot of people coming down to pay their respects to uh, – to, uh, uh, Medgar Evers, he was a civil rights leader. Martin Luther King was coming down there to 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 pay his respect to the body, and uh, and others. Uh, what we would do, we would put in three times as much embalming fluid as as usual, and oh. uh, and there was hot weather there, and the three the three times as much embalming fluid, the th formaldehyde. Uh, is apparently what preserved the body in excellent condition and prevented the deterioration during the week that people came down and he wasn't refrigerated. So uh, that was the that was the, there are there are all kinds of stories about how Lenin's body uh, and other people are were uh, uh, especially embalmed by miracle miracle workers. Uh, this is just. Uh, Put extra extra embalming <laughs> fluid in and extra formaldehyde uh, that uh, he kept it in shape, and it was uh, because of that that the juries were able to see him as a living person and found him uh, found um, uh, the perpetrator be um, uh, guilty of the crime. He who later died in um, in um, uh, in jail. Uh, there were a lot of uh, then, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 inquiries that you know, judicial inquiries that uh, uh, failed. So he stayed in prison and uh, died of uh, colon cancer, I think. Got you. Uh, you know, I should have asked you this earlier. Uh, how long is the average autopsy? Um, Number one of a fresh body, but also we're speaking about Mega Evers. Is it the same process for a body that has uh, been dug up after decades? Well, uh, the the process is the same. The, the normally the the, the uh, usual autopsy uh, done uh, by medical examiner uh, probably is about two hours. Uh, kind of where, uh, well, and the, the autopsy process uh, is to make two incisions. Two, uh, uh, one is uh, uh, what's called a Y-shaped incision. That's an incision on, on the chest and abdomen uh, uh, from uh, one shoulder uh, to the pit of the stomach to the, uh, and the other shoulder that's uh, two, sh and down to the uh, pubic bones. It looks like a Y, and by opening up those uh, incisions, one can examine the heart, the lungs, uh, the um, the all of the abdominal organs. Uh, the uh, other incision is from ear to ear, back of the ear, to, to be able to get at the brain. Uh, those are the traditional uh, uh, incisions that are made. When we do a second autopsy. When we do a second autopsy, 
we open up those incisions. The, the, the body, when it's finished, will be sewn up so that – and the, the face preserved so the body can be shown to the family. And then um, the only part – things that I would see would be the face really because the body is clothed. Uh, and when we do a second autopsy, whether it's a few weeks later or 30 years later – we do the same thing. We open up uh, the uh, the uh, incisions, and with uh, Medgar Evers, uh, what we were able to do is take X-rays of the body, and there were still some fragments uh, of the. Even though the bullet went in in the back and out uh, uh, the the front, he was shot in the back, going through his lung, his, his right lung. Uh, there were bullet fragments uh, that were left on the on the ribs that were struck, and I was able to remove those little fragments, metal fragments from the bullet, even though the bullet was no longer could, could no longer be found. And uh, I put them in a test, a glass test tube, showed them to the jury, you know, that this is, is part of the uh, uh, a bullet. And the, the, the jury passed it around and shook it to hear the tinkling of the metal and were satisfied uh, that this was uh, part of the, the cause of death of Ed, Medgar Evers because what the prosecution had to show was that not only is the rifle uh, part, uh, but also that the bullet is part of the, uh, uh, of the cause of death. And um, the jury uh, came back, all 12 jurors, that this was uh, a murder, which uh, 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 they didn't come back. It's, it's amazing that in the 60s that they were able to get a hung jury, uh, that there were at least one or more jurors who didn't go along with uh, the fact that uh, uh, a, a, a guilty verdict at that time. Because there was so everybody was so uh, 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 much more biased in those days. Understood. Okay, I want to talk about another high-profile case. Um, probably, arguably, um, one of the most high-profile cases that you served in. Uh, August tenth and eleventh, nineteen ninety-five. I'm sure those dates ring a bell. The O.J. Simpson trial. The trial of the century. This case, I, I think we can all uh, agree. It was fascinating for so many reasons. You were called in by the defense and you made a couple of statements. First, you claimed that Nicole Brown Simpson was standing and conscience when her throat was slashed. This was important because the purpose of the claim was to dispute the theory that Nicole was the intended target. The prosecution then argued, as you know, that Brown was the intended target and she was the first to be killed because the soles of her feet didn't have any blood on them, despite the large amount of blood that was at the scene. You also said that um, Ron Goldman had remained conscious and he fought his assailant for at least 10 minutes before his um, jugular vein was severed. And the purpose of that statement was just explaining the length of time that the entire crime had taken place. You later disowned those statements. So... Looking back, hindsight is twenty twenty. What do you believe happened in that OJ case? What my opinion were, was then and now is that with Ron Goldman, that he was standing while being stabbed and cut and fighting. That I say that because... There are blood drops going down his pants, down to his shoes, so that in order for the blood that was coming out of the various stab wounds, 
uh, and cut wounds, uh, he had to be bleeding and standing upright. And this would have taken a few minutes of struggle. I, I, whoever said that I said he was 10 minutes is, is misquoting, misquoting what I said. And I think the, the point that you, you raised, uh, I said something a, one time and then another time uh, is not true. I've been consistent the whole time. It's just that, what, especially in high profile cases, there's often a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding that comes into it. Ron Goldman struggled and was uh, was um, uh, died uh, was on his feet struggling for a few minutes, not as long as ten minutes, but while he was bleeding before he collapsed. Uh, uh, as far as Nicole goes, uh, Nicole was was uh, was cut and she was the object uh, Nicole was the object of 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 the uh, uh, whoever made the attack uh, that uh, she had blood stains on her back while she's on the ground there were blood stains on her back that whoever was uh, stabbing her uh, the and stabbing Goldman uh, were came off the knife that was being going back and forth, but in addition to the blood stains uh, f from uh, the uh, dripping knife, there was uh, a, a, some blood stains that looked like they came from the perpetrator on the back. On her back was a large, a, a particularly large blood drop that was more consistent with coming from the dripping of the uh, cut on the hand of the perpetrator, which happens because if one stabs many times, that um, uh, blood is very slippery. Blood is slippery, and one can slip and cut oneself on the uh, uh, top of the uh, uh, stab uh, of, of the blade. And none of that was collected. None of that was swabbed up and collected. And that my uh, uh, concern was that if if the the unusual blood stains had been removed and showed that they came from a different person, not from either uh, Goldman or Nicole, then um, uh, that would immediately t give DNA on it as who the real perpetrator was. Because at that time the issue was was it was it uh, was. Um, O.J. the perpetrator, or was there another perpetrator, and um, uh, which was the real issue, and that had to do with uh, uh, with the various injuries on the body, but um, the the issue, uh, 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 and there was so much misinformation about about uh, what everybody did in, in, in uh, the O.J. Simpson in the, in the media. Uh, but my uh, opinion was uh, that uh, uh, I agreed with the police that uh, Nicole was the, uh, was the um, uh, uh, she was the main subject, was, was, was the subject of, of the uh, uh, stab wound. It was just... Uh, is there enough proof to say that it was O.J. who did it, not somebody else? And that had to do with the t also with the time of death that became an issue. Correct. That that's why uh, Ron Goldman fighting for ten minutes. The, the time comes into play, as you know, because if Ron and O.J. are allegedly fighting for that long, you know. OJ has an alibi. Hey, I was back at the house when all of this was going on. Um, looking back on this thing, do you believe the jurors got it wrong? Because the jurors, they believed you. Well, uh, part of it, remember, I was one of many witnesses, and there were many for scientific uh, witnesses. Correct. There was a lot of new DNA that came into it. Uh, I think I testified and gave the same opinion from the cause of death in the criminal trial and in the uh, civil trial. Remember, after he was found not guilty, uh, then the family had a criminal trial, uh, a civil trial, 
And I said the same thing, and that jury convicted, found that uh, O.J. was guilty. But the, I, th- I think that this goes, to, this goes to lawyering. I think in the first in the criminal trial, Johnny Cochran, Barry Sheck, and uh, Peter Neufeld from the Innocence Project, uh, and a couple of other lawyers presented the defense much, uh, much better than the uh, prosecution did. I think that, uh, especially Johnny Cochran, that uh, uh, the jury loved loved him and loved the uh, the uh, Peter and uh, and Barry Sheck, and uh, uh, they found and because when it's hard to read a juror's mind, the jury is there and they are going to, they hear a lot of conflicting evidence and they decide not only who the, who the uh, 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 witness is, I'm saying certain things, but they're also measuring who the, uh, uh, pri- who the uh, attorneys are. And uh, that, I just, my p- opinion is that it, it was more that the, uh, uh, jury decided on uh, not only the witnesses, but also on the attorneys uh, in the criminal case in favor of OJ. Uh, and that um, in the um, civil case, uh, I think the, uh, the the plaintiff lawyers, the lawyers for the civil case were better than the uh, uh, defense attorneys. Uh, I mean, the, the, the plaintiffs than the um, defendants. So uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, my testimony was involved with the uh, uh, criminal decision in favor of OJ, and my same testimony in the defense case, uh, which they found in favor of uh, the Goldman family rather than OJ, against OJ. You know, there has been rumors um, and conspiracies around this case, like so many others, as you know, um, that there was more than one assailant. Uh, What does your your expertise tell you? Was there only one person stabbing these victims, or could there have been multiple assailants? Well, uh, yeah, we can't tell uh, from uh, just uh, uh, knife wounds usually uh, uh, whether th- as easily as we can with gunshot wounds. Gunshot wounds, we could tell how many guns were used. Uh, with knife wounds, stab wounds, it's much harder to know how many uh, instruments there are. One can get a lot of information, but there are a lot of, a lot of similar knives. Uh, you can't distinguish specific knives necessarily. Uh, and I think with OJ, uh, all of the cut wounds and stab wounds could have come from the same uh, from the same um, uh, weapon, and uh, could have been uh, one or more people. And w- we can't say as medical examiners who done it. In fact, Sean, just to be careful, uh, the medical examiners we find as the medical examiners. Uh, who, what, where, when, why, and how somebody is killed. But the who is not who done it. The who is the identity, who the victim is. Part of what we have to do is make be careful um, uh, that we're not issuing a death certificate on the wrong person. So we have to establish identity by uh, friends identifying, by uh, DNA, by fingerprints, uh, the who, what happened, we're able to say what happened uh, from the scene, what, why, not always why, but sometimes we can see if there's excess beatings and all that. It was somebody who knew him. Where, wh- where is important. One of the first things we do is we see a body at the scene. Is, is this the places where the death occurred or was the person transferred there uh, after uh, death? That's uh, where rigor mortis and lividity become very important. And when, the when is w- what time it happened. And there again, rigor mortis, lividity, the things that happen after death. 
We don't know who done it. Who done it is not up to us. So I'm saying with OJ uh, that uh, uh, we know what happened to him, who was up to the police and the prosecutor. And I could say from my where I sit, I think that the uh, defense with Johnny Cochran did a better job, a better job uh, than the prosecution in the prose- in, in the uh, criminal case and the family attorneys uh, in the civil case did a better job than the uh, OJ defense attorneys did uh, in that case. Uh, Got gotcha. you. But uh, otherwise, I'm, my opinion as the cause of death or who done it is irrelevant. As we know, that case really tore at the fabric of this country along racial lines. Um, did you, after um, testifying on behalf of the defense, did, did your consultant practice take a hit or, or you know, did people respect your findings? It, it varies. It varies. Uh, uh, remember, I was then uh, still, when in the O.J. Simpson uh, case, uh, the chief forensic pathologist for the New York State Police. Mm-hmm. My relationship was independent. I was allowed in my uh, contract with the state police. I was able to do c- private cases uh, that didn't conflict with New York State Police uh, functioning. But uh, uh, there were a lot of state police people who were upset at me for being part of the uh, I could pro- imagine prosecution on that case. Uh, but uh, that, uh, especially when the verdict came back in favor in the criminal case for OJ, uh, but um, uh, that uh, uh, every time, every time uh, I testify in a case, one side's going to be happy and the other side's not going to be happy with the outcome. You know, if I've testified, 90% of the time I testify for prosecutors with my work with the New York City Medical Examiner's Office and with the state police, uh, so that uh, the, so that 90% of the time, uh, if uh, my testimony is part of the, you know, is for the side that wins, uh, for the prosecution, they're very happy. Uh, but the defense aren't happy. You know, the other parts so, and vice versa. So we're always stepping on toes because we're always either uh, we're helping one side or the other side. But uh, in the past uh, 10 years or so, since I retired from the and from the state police and doing civil, regular uh, forensic pathology, uh, private work, uh, I do about 50-50 uh, uh, defense and uh, plaintiff. And there's always somebody who... Uh, who's going to be uh, upset. But certainly, I think, uh, you know, my involvement in the, in the, uh, in the um, um, uh, OJ case, uh, you know, made me better, I guess, better known than I had been before that. But um, as far as uh, uh, being called for cases, lawyers like to call experts who they think, uh, some lawyers, uh, will will side with their side, uh, no matter what, no matter what, and they know in general that uh, I don't always side with the people who want to hire me. So I get, uh, I don't get as many calls as you think I might have gotten. They they were most uh, many lawyers just want to hire somebody who's going to support them. Like you know, I'm hiring you, therefore we want you to come out and testify. Uh, according to my theory of the case. And uh, there's enough people who know that that doesn't always work, so they don't want to hire me for me to tell them you got the wrong theory. Got you. Makes perfect sense. And that's why I asked that question. Uh, You also testified at this Phil Spector trial. Phil Spector, as uh, some people may know him, uh, many may not, eccentric, uh, producer, well known in the music industry, worked with the Beatles. Uh, you know, he has major hits under his belt. He was accused allegedly of shooting 
Lana Clarkson, in the mouth. What was your thoughts on that trial and what were you called to do specifically? Yeah, um, I was called early on in the case um, um, by the lawyer for Phil Spector uh, to uh, review uh, the, uh, the cause of death, go over the material uh, in determining whether this was a homicide I was called by the Phil Sp- by the defend uh, Specter had already been arrested for this by the defense attorney uh, to review the death to see if there's anything uh, that would be helpful in the findings uh, because their their um, uh, uh, position was that it, it was self inflicted that the gunshot wound of the mouth was self inflicted when I reviewed uh, all of the photographs. Uh, uh, taken at the autopsy, a lot of autopsy, a lot of photographs were taken. Uh, uh, I thought from a uh, autopsy point of view, Dr. Henry Lee was also uh, uh, consulted. Uh, he's a criminalist, in, from, and we worked kind of together uh, in reviewing, in, in uh, coming into Los Angeles, examining um, uh, the information. Uh, going to the house where this occurred, the, the autopsy uh, showed a gunshot wound of the uh, of the mouth, and that is usual. That is usual in self-inflicted uh, suicides because it's very hard to put a, um, a a gun in the mouth of somebody who does who keeps the jaw shut, uh, jaws closed. Uh, so uh, the first thing was. Uh, that I found that the bullet wound itself discharged while the uh, muzzle was inside of the mouth. It didn't go through the teeth. It, the, uh, the, uh, t- t- the mouth was open. Also, that there was a fracture of the thumbnail. I've seen a few times when uh, people put, bullet, put uh, guns in their mouth in order to fire the weapon, it's hard to do it in the normal course of with an index finger. When they fi- discharge the weapon, they do it with the thumb on the on the trigger, the hand on the um, uh, on the weapon on the outside, and the thumb on the trigger. Uh, and it was fractured; it was broken off, which is typical. Uh, for other uh, situation I looked at when there's a discharge of using the thumb uh, against the the uh, the um, um, uh, trigger, and that it was entirely all consistent with the um, a gun in the mouth self that was self uh, that was fired by uh, Lana Clarkson that she had a lot of alcohol in her and uh, maybe some other things that uh, might have contributed to somebody uh, 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 committing suicide and it was my uh, and and that it was no gunshot debris no discharge on the outside of the face it wasn't from uh, a distance. Uh, Dr. Lee found other information, uh, other things that, uh, and w- we discussed the trajectory of the bullet was uh, in the mouth was more consistent with uh, the, being held and self discharged whether from the outside, but uh, that was uh, my um, my finding and all that. This is all consistent with. Uh, the um, uh, trigger being pulled by Lana Clarkson and was not discharged by somebody who was standing uh, across from her. Okay, who, as we who, know. Who also, uh, Sean, who didn't get any blood, uh, there was no blood on his, uh, or discharge on his clothing, which would have happened if he were up close with the gun in the mouth because there was discharge of material, for blood from the mouth. Uh, following the discharge of the gun. Understood. Phil Spector, his first trial ended in a mistrial, hung jury. Yes. Second, His second trial 
he's found guilty, spends the remainder of his days behind bars where he eventually expires. It sounds to me that from your expert opinion, as well as Dr. Henry Lee, uh, her death was more consistent with accidental suicide, if not intentional suicide. Yeah, Sean, I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, that uh, both Henry Lee and I had uh, agreed that this was much more typical for self-inflicted uh, injury rather than homicide. But remember, Sean, uh, there were maybe 40 or other witnesses uh, that I've learned over the, uh, uh, you know, when I first started to testify, I would think, boy, my my uh, uh, testimony is critical in this case. Well, it turns out there are many other people who testify, and uh, uh, that may be more critical. That the jury, that it all depends on whom the jury, you know, how jury uh, uh, decides. But I, I think you got it right that Dr. Lee and I both felt and testified that this was self-inflicted and not, um, uh, and not. Um, homicide, and there was a disagreement in the first uh, trial that uh, that uh, the juries couldn't arrive at a conclusion. Some I don't know how many people felt one way or the other, but they couldn't get a, a, a unanimous conclusion. It went to a second trial. I didn't testify in the second trial. Okay, and ultimately in the second trial, he's found guilty. Uh I want to talk about another case that ripped America um, right at its core. Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri, 2014. Young African-American male is shot something like six times by um, Officer Darren Wilson. You were called to testify in that case as well. First and foremost, who reached out to you? And secondly, what were your findings there? Um, The attorneys for Michael Brown's family reached out to me. Um, He was about 18, 19 years, a young fellow. Young Uh, man. Young man. And uh, Michael Brown uh, shot from the front uh multiple times and that uh he wasn't a threat that he didn't appear to be a threat to the officer he was a distance away from the officer uh the officer uh wasn't threatened uh, wasn't uh, uh, sufficiently threatened to be, to have to kill it, to shoot him uh, but, but that the, the, the what gathered most attention to that is after the shooting, uh, the way his body was left exposed in hot in a hot weather, uh, bleeding from the bullet wound to the head, and that um, uh, he um, um, uh, was kept in that and wouldn't let his mom go near him. His mother was at the uh, uh, trying to get to see th- to his son to her son and the police were there wouldn't um, wouldn't um, uh, let her uh, go to the son who didn't cover up the body and that gained a lot of publicity but my opinion was uh, that um, he uh, he died of the multiple uh, gunshot wounds and that um, uh he there was evidence that he had his hand in the police car uh at the time um to show to show that uh, that part of the officer's testimony that he was threatening him in a police car uh was uh legitimate but that uh the uh autopsy findings uh, were consistent with his being shot uh, while he was no longer a threat to the uh, officer. Got you. So, 
you know, because it, it, there's so much that have come out in that Michael Brown case. On one hand, we know the cop claimed that he was being attacked um, by Mr. Brown, which ultimately made him uh, fire. But witnesses said Michael Brown's hands were raised at the time of um, of him being shot multiple times. And there was one gunshot wound in particular, if, I, if my memory serves me correct, which was to the top of the head, almost as right. though he was falling. Yes. Um, so you're saying that your findings shows that at the time of him being shot, he was at a distance from the officer. Yes. And, and, and what, what I could say is that it was consistent with uh, witnesses who said that he was standing with his head down and not charging the officer. It was consistent with the officers, with the witnesses, but it doesn't exclude, it, it, it could also be consistent. I can't tell if he was in motion or not. The witnesses gotcha. said he had stopped uh, and uh, the there was the one bullet wound at the top of the head that co would have caused him immediately to fall to the ground because it caused damage to the brain. Uh, and and uh, would have made him, and in that, in the Michael Brown situation, um, uh, that uh, depending on that, that the witnesses, uh, it was consistent with the witnesses uh, 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 said, uh, but couldn't rule out, couldn't rule out that uh, uh, the um, uh, the officer felt threatened. Understood. Okay, I want to talk to you. In 2017, you also conducted a, a, an autopsy on former NFL player Aaron Hernandez. Aaron Hernandez was found guilty of uh, murdering Odin Lloyd. Um, he had another trial in which he was acquitted for two other murders. Right after his acquittal, he's found hung to death in his cell. It comes out that he has CTE. So when you did the autopsy and you had a chance to study his brain, do you think it was the CTE that caused him to commit suicide in his cell? That that's tough. What happened with with what, what happened with uh, Hernandez, who is this magnificent football player for uh, Boston, uh, Boston, New England? Yep, New England Patriots. Yeah. Uh, he he had been found uh, guilty of one murder. He was now charged with two other uh, two other murders. I got involved in it partially only because Jose Baez uh, uh, was hired for the second um, uh, uh, case. Uh, an attorney uh, that my wi wife had worked with uh, uh, in uh, other cases. Uh, and my wife got involved in it, who was an attorney, Linda Kenny Baden. Uh, and they defended Hernandez in the second case. Now, the second case was the two murders. The jury knew, the jury knew uh, that um, um, Hernandez had already been uh, been uh, found guilty in the first in the first case with. Uh, so this seemed, uh, now there was a second uh, case. Uh, it, it was amazing. And I was up uh, there a few times because my wife was uh, the attorney there with Jose Baez. And it was amazing that the, the uh, defense lawyers for Hernandez uh, were able to get a not guilty verdict in the second, in, 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 the, in the second case. And Baez and my wife felt that the reason that uh, that an appeal, they had started an appeal in the first case, that the first uh, uh, decision uh, against him uh, uh, was wrong, and they had, were appealing the verdict in the first case to have a second uh, uh, to see if they could, if he could be uh, uh, found not guilty or, or in the first case too because of errors that were made uh, in the in the case he was found guilty. I was up there for the verdict in the second case, and I had met Hernandez. Uh, the, he he was a 
a, a, a very nice person as far as I could see. He was very helpful uh, in the times I met him uh, in, the, in the courtroom, actually. Uh, when he was found dead in his cell, hanging immediately after, you know, within a couple of days after being found not guilty, there was a big concern that uh, by the family and that and 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 um, um, uh, the lawyers uh, that uh, he was hanged. That it was a homicide and, and not a, a suicide. So uh, I was asked by Baez the to do a second autopsy, um, and as part of the sec to see whether or not there was any evidence. Uh, that this was uh, that he was uh, 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 strangled and then hung up uh, to make it look like a suicide, and in my findings it w were consistent with uh, a suicide, but uh, I was concerned about uh, the reason why, and told uh, Bias that we uh, that this the brain should be studied uh, for CTE. Uh, uh, and now, and, and the um, the doctors who do the study, the pathologists who do the study, are in Boston. They're also in Boston. So doc, uh, Jose Bias uh, um, then was able to get uh, the uh, over opposition. Uh, from from uh, some opposition it was to, uh, to have the brain transferred from the autopsy to the um, um, uh, group studying CTE, and they found he had tremendous CTE uh, in his in his brain. Uh, and then the issue comes up, as you raised, did this contribute to his committing suicide? Because uh, the rest of the findings, and my findings were that it was consistent with a self-inflicted suicide. Uh, and not homicide, more consistent with suicide than homicide, uh, but that the cause of it may have been the, um, the, the CTE, and that's a real problem because there's a high incidence of suicide in football players who have the, uh, this kind of brain damage due to, caused by uh, uh, repeated blows to the head, blows that may not cause death or subdural hemorrhages or da outer damage to the brain, but cause severe damage over time. His damage was very severe for his young age and could very well have been contributed to uh, uh, the reason that he committed suicide because of his uh, uh, damaged brain from uh, uh, his football playing. Got you. Yeah, it, 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 I remember that case very well, and uh, the fact that he, and if memory serves me correct, his um, he was found not guilty. He in the know, second trial found not in guilty. in the second trial, and and days later, when most people would think that he is on a high, um, and and he's now going to challenge the first trial, um. With an appeal, he turns up dead in his cell. So, wow. Okay, another case that you were involved in that, you know, and you were involved in so many. I mean, we can go on for days, but this one was uh, another very high-profile, controversial case. Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein, another one, found dead in his cell, allegedly due to hanging. Who reached out to you from the Epstein camp, and what were your findings in that case? Well, I, I got a call um, for actually from uh, the brother uh, the, uh, 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 of Jeffrey Epstein um, and from a lawyer. The lawyer was really a lawyer for the estate. The, the lawyer for the state called, uh, and um, they were concerned— that uh, he didn't commit suicide, that uh, that he, uh, they already knew uh, 
uh, that there was some uh, they 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 felt that he was in good good uh, mental condition that he uh, was um, his lawyers were trying to get him out on probation uh, out a uh, pending trial the trial and all and um, uh, asked me to come down and do it w- within a day two days uh, with they called me excuse me uh, Sean they called me immediately I was up. Uh, it was COVID time. I was up uh, in a place uh, that we had in uh, the Catskill Mountains uh, to hide from COVID. And um, uh, I came down and was there, was asked by the family, agreed to by the medical examiner, to be there while the autopsy was done. See, before the autopsy was done. Uh, so I was there uh, uh Consulting, uh, uh, watching, and uh, the, the autopsy, uh, w- w- making requests of things to be done uh, if necessary uh, as part of the autopsy. I didn't do the autopsy, but I was there for the autopsy. During the course of the autopsy, it became apparent that there was a ligature mark around his neck from where he supposedly was, died of hanging, and that there were multiple fractures of the bones underneath it. The windpipe was fractured uh, in three places. It was more of a crush injury than a hanging injury. And um, that there were hemorrhages in the eyes, uh, that this was more of a strangulation case, manual strangulation case, than or a ligature strangulation uh, by somebody else, not by hanging in a cell. Because in hanging, there are there aren't that many fractures. The hanging, the the bone, the uh, ligature comes up under the mandible, under the jawbone, which is above the ligature, uh, above the uh, uh, Adam's apple. Uh, the ligature is higher than the Adam's apple, so he had three, two fractures of the Adam's apple, and uh, a fracture of the bone right above the Adam's apple, with the hyoid bone that the, uh, the, lig- the mark on the neck didn't match the sheet uh, ligature that was present in the, um, in the cell, the photograph of the, and that this was uh, uh, more typical of a homicidal strangulation than of a suicide. Uh, and this is right at the time. This wasn't an exhumation. This wasn't a second autopsy. This was just what the first autopsy was. What happened was the doctor did the first autopsy, did a very nice autopsy, and also was concerned about uh, whether it's a homicide or suicide, was considering it, and, and left the initial death certificate was the undetermined pending further study. But the chief medical examiner at the time, a few days later, changed it to homicide. And, uh, and then uh, there was a lot of information came out, out that he was, uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, the correction officers who were supposed to check the cell, his cell every 15 minutes or half hour, didn't do that for, 10, for about eight or 10 hours. Uh, and uh, nobody looked into the cell or, or on the, um, uh, uh, the site where the cell was, and that the, uh, the video was, uh, didn't work. And there was a lot of other things came up to uh, also raise the issue of whether somebody else did the uh, strangulation. But uh, my opinion is still that it's more likely um, uh, a homicide than a suicide. You know, it's very interesting that um, in such a high-profile case that America's talking about, uh, there's no video. You know, you would think that a video camera would be directly pointed to that cell for this specific reason. Who went in, who who came out. You know, I got to believe he was on possibly a suicide watch so to not have any video is very, very strange, number one. Sean, may uh, just interrupt for the thing? Yeah, he was on suicide watch. Uh, he had another person in the cell with him who was taken out the day before. Uh, 
And there were video cameras in his cell. There was a video camera pointed to his cell and one on the tier. Both of those videos weren't working at the time. They were there, but for whatever reason, uh, they weren't working and didn't capture anything. And the door, yeah. and he wasn't checked for about more than eight hours, for, uh, uh, as I recall. Yeah, very, very um, suspicious, to say the least. It was, a convenient, it was a convenient death for a lot of people. Yeah, I got to ask you something, because we spoke about uh, Aaron Hernandez and Jeff Epstein, both of which died of um, hanging, if you will. Are there any consistencies in terms of hanging? Because you you made clear that, yes, I believe Aaron Hernandez did die. His his injuries were consistent with hanging. On the other hand, Jeffrey Epstein, no, this is more homicide. What are you looking for? Is is is, is the eyes, are the capillaries in the eyes bursting? Is there uh, blood that rushes down to the feet? What, what, what are you looking for that tells you this was or was not a suicide? Well, uh, specifically, uh, the, the amount of damage to the neck first of all, uh, is, is most important in evaluating the question of suicide versus homicide with uh, compression, next, uh, with strangulation. Both of them die of strangulation. Suicide strangulation, the person is, the ligatures around the neck, the, the head weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, so the person is, uh, say, a 180-pound person, if you're hanging uh, uh, with your feet off the ground in a normal hanging, there's 180 pounds less 10. It's 170 pounds of pressure around the neck, the upper neck above the windpipe. That compresses all the blood vessels uh, so that there's no blood going to the brain. And because there's no blood going to the uh, vein, the person will pass out in less than 10 seconds with a, the normal hanging, no compression of the, uh, of the skin. There's a, a ligature mark on the skin, but no hemorrhage underneath it. It's all compression underneath. No fractures. So occasionally, there'll be a fracture, one fracture, uh, depending on how wide the ligature is. In a homicide, there are multiple fractures of the windpipe, and there are... Uh, Particular hemorrhages, a little uh, in the in the eyes, in the whites of the eye, little hemorrhages of capillaries, because when one uh, is compressing the neck, say with a hand, you know, and, and manual strangulation, for example, the um, the um, uh, veins, the veins of the ne of the neck are collapsed, but not the arteries. The arteries can still pump blood because there's not enough pressure on them. So they're pumping blood up to the brain and to the eyes, and it can't get back into the heart because the veins are collapsed. So the capillaries in the eyes start to pop and give the little particular hemorrhages. In a, a, in a normal hanging, in a normal hanging, because all arteries and veins are collapsed by the weight of the body, uh, there's no blood flow to the brain at all, and no blood flow. So they, there's no particular hemorrhages. You, you don't get the little hemorrhages in the eyes, uh, which is a, a, a difference between hanging. Now that's when their feet are off the ground. If the feet are on the ground, so that part of the weight of the body is on the feet, then the uh, compression pressure is not a, is not the the full weight of the body but partial weight, so sometimes you can get a little uh, hemorrhage, a little blood going to the brain, you can get a little bit of particular hemorrhages. Uh, in this situation, uh, the guards, the two guards who found him refused to say what condition he was in. They were initially arrested and charged. Remember, the problem with, the, with the, in part with the death of Jeffrey Epstein is he was in a federal prison. So he was not in New York City uh, 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 jurisdiction. He's in a federal prison. 
and that the FBI did all the investigation into the prison. The New York City people didn't. New York City police didn't, who have much more, uh, uh, much more um, uh, uh, um, familiarity and experience with homicides and with uh, suicidal deaths in prison than than the uh, federal government, and the uh, the guards r- who are federal were taken into custody and t- charged uh, because they they. Had made false entries about what it's about seeing Epstein. Uh, they said they saw him every half hour, or, or I think, or every fifteen minutes uh, for the eight hours he was there. That was not true. Nobody saw what was happening for those uh, two shifts. It was the end of one shift and the start of another shift that there was uh, impro- uh, that he wasn't properly observed. They they initially arrested and then they made a deal with them somehow. Uh, he, they never came to trial, the two witnesses, the two guards, to say how they found him. Did they find him hanging? We don't know that, whether they found him hanging. All they know is they came in, they realized they were in trouble. The body was taken, the body was taken to the infirmary, apparently. Uh, nobody saw the scene except there, were, there was a ligature on the ground. My view of the ligature on the, gra- on the, uh, on the ground uh, from the sheet from the photographs that were taken, doesn't match the ligature mark around the neck. The imprint around the neck doesn't match the ligature. And the fractures, uh, the multiple fractures would indicate that there was uh, more likely homicide than suicide. But uh, we never, as far as I know, the federal government has not released at all the... um, the, um, uh, uh, what the guard, what the uh, guards said, they I believe uh, 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 withdrew their uh, their uh, arrest of the, uh, uh, but never released how how Epstein was found. As I said, the autopsy begins at the scene. We don't know how the body is. Uh, how Mr. Epstein was when he was found by the guards, whether he was hanging, uh, whether he was on his knees, whether uh, uh, somebody came into the cell because this we don't know whether his cell door was locked or unlocked from the investigation. And I would say one thing to you, uh, Sean, because of my experience with Attica, uh, that uh, with the Attica uh, autopsies and all, the... Uh, The reason for the uh, Attica in great measure was because uh, the inmates at the time were concerned that people were dying who were not properly taken care of medically or who were beaten up by guards and it was all the deaths were covered up by death certificates that said heart disease. That, uh, and that was what, so after after Attica, Governor uh, Rockefeller set up a special board to look into all deaths in prisons, uh, prisons, jails, and lockups throughout New York State. New York State Commission Medical Review Board. Five members were appointed to investigate every death that occurs in the, in the prison system, uh, including uh, a, a forensic pathologist. I was there, uh, appointed by the governor to be that per- forensic pathologist. And during the past year since Attica, every death that that occurs in the prison, jails, and lockups in New York State are investigated by that board. And if he had, uh, if Epstein had died in a New York City prison, I would have reviewed that case officially. Uh, He wasn't. That was a federal prison. And over the course of the pair, more than 50 years of that board, I've been reappointed to that board uh, by eight different governors. And we've investigated uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, hanging deaths, and uh, is one of the more common ways that people die in prison. And uh, none of them have the kind of marks that uh, Jeffrey Epstein has around the neck and the kind of fractures that he has. Very, very insightful. Very insightful. You know, many people do believe exactly what you said, that he was murdered. It was not a suicide. Um, 
Very insightful information. Thank you so much for sh- for sharing that um, insight. You you mentioned several times through this interview George Floyd. Um, in that George Floyd case, I know you were brought on. Uh, I, I think it was through your friend Ben Crump, correct? Yes, yes. I heard you make mention um, in earlier interviews that you believe that you, um, Derek Shaven. The officer who was ultimately found guilty of his murder, um, he had his knee on his neck for over nine minutes. But you believe that George was dead maybe four minutes into that. Why why, why do you believe that? Uh, Because he stopped. uh, He had been saying, talking out, and you can hear on on the witness video, That he's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I think they counted 27 times that he may have said, I can't breathe. He was moving around. He was trying to move his head and his back. Uh, And because he was moving around to try and breathe, because there was pressure on his back uh, as well as uh, uh, on his neck, uh, the uh, – uh, officers thought that he was trying to get away. He said he's struggling to get away. He was struggling to be able to move his chest around so he could move his lungs and breathe. At about four minutes or so, four or five minutes into the that uh, situation, he was he stopped moving. He stopped talking, and uh, that would be because he lost consciousness and. The kind of pressure that was put on him would mean that he would probably be dead within uh, a minute or two afterwards. That, and then when they picked him up, the little bit that can seen when they put him into the uh, stretcher, Correct. He, yep. he was already in complete uh, cardiac arrest, uh, and he didn't respond to the CPR that was done in the ambulance. So George Floyd was was dead before the uh, the ambulance people get there. And uh, he he was they had him on the knee and all on him and the back pressure for nine minutes, uh, but he was dead uh, and not moving, um, um, uh, and his heart had stopped before the ambulance had gotten there. You know, we hear cases, and you also you also mentioned earlier in this conversation, Eric Garner. Um, yes. You know. We hear these cases of of people being put in rear naked chokes. Um, George Floyd had a knee to the back of his neck. In general, how long would it take for someone to lose consciousness and ultimately lose lose life? Because if I can remember correctly, uh, Eric Gardner, he was put in that rear naked choke, but it wasn't nowhere near as long as George Floyd had the knee on the back of his neck. So could someone pass away within seconds or minutes? <laughs> Sean, very good. Uh, what Again, just like with George Floyd, it was the, the uh, witness cell phone that contained a great deal of information. Uh, about what happened because the autopsy doesn't show the, the, the neck compression. With Eric Garner, there was also a young man who, who, uh, uh, did a cell phone of, uh, the takedown of Eric Garner. And one can, and that, uh, video, uh, is, was on the internet, it was on the net, internet. And that video shows, uh, that, from the time he was touched, touched by the officer, there was a little bit of a discussion and confrontation. The officers tried to go after him. The first touching of him and putting an uh, uh, arm around his neck to the time that they realize that he's motionless, that he's uh, motionless, that he's not resisting, and he's dead essentially, was about 48 seconds you can see it on the video because there's a time, there's a continuous video. Uh, and that's because in the video, there's the arm around the neck, the so choke hold or yoke hold, or, or the, and, and there was also pressure on his back, 
with the two different ways in which uh, it interferes with oxygen. And he also was a heavy, uh, heavy uh, person who had an enlarged heart. But um, the, the time, when I started out, the, the, the when uh, there was an unruly person, when police in New York City responded to an unruly person uh, and uh, told him to put his hand behind his back uh, and he didn't f- t- t- comply, they would compress his neck with a ch- with an arm arm across the neck or or nightstick across the neck to try and interfere with his breathing until they uh, got him to pass out so they could ha- handcuff him. That is type of pressure on the neck that causes a lot of fractures and hemorrhage in the neck that you find at autopsy. And in trying to stop somebody from breathing with neck pressure, it uh, takes a few minutes before the uh, oxygen level goes down. But shortly after I started in the 70s, the, the Los Angeles Police Department developed what's called a, a carotid sleeper hold. That's uh, uh, instead of pressing on the front of the neck, the arm can be put around the sides of the neck. The, the elbow, uh, 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 crook, the elbow uh, goes across the windpipe, so it doesn't compress the windpipe. The, but this pressure from the arm and forearm against the sides of the neck, that when it's done properly, w- compresses the carotid arteries, the artery that you try to get a blood pressure from, with tight pressure against w- w- in that uh, carotid sleeper hold, the triangulation hold. Uh, the pressure of the neck prevents any blood from going to the brain. If you can cut off the brain quickly, the the blood going to the brain, the person will lose consciousness within eight seconds, eight or 10 seconds, so that a blockage of, of the airflow in the front takes time and struggle. Blockage to the blood flow to the brain um, happens in seconds. The reason for that is the oxygen needs continuous blood supply. Cut off the uh, uh, the carotid arteries, uh, and the br- person passes out right away. If you cut off the breath supply, you can the oxygen in the blood can uh, continue to nourish the brain, even if you hold your breath or underwater swimming for two or three minutes in some people. But uh, because there's still oxygen going to the brain uh, if, you're, if, the bre- if you can't breathe. But there's no oxygen if you do it on uh, uh, compressing the uh, blood vessels in the side of the neck. And so a carotid sleeper hold can lose consciousness within less than 10 seconds. If you leave it on for a longer time, that can cause brain damage or death. And so uh, um, uh, the uh, police, uh, the idea of the, uh, of the um, uh, carotid uh, chokehold uh, is to get the person unconscious and to immediately put the handcuffs on and take the, the uh, pressure off the neck so the person can start, uh, the blood flow can start circulating again. That also happens with tasers. The idea of the taser is the person will lose consciousness for uh, uh, enough seconds to put the handcuffs on, but if you do it too long, it can cause other harm. Got you. Okay, before I let you go, I'm looking at your new book, American Autopsy. Why now? Why, after all of these years um, of doing what you do, did you find the need to write this particular book? And in your many years of practicing, what have you learned about death itself? Uh, Well, one of the things I can appreciate about death itself over time, to answer that first, is there's a popular thought that people ask me, how can you do medical examiners work on dead bodies? Isn't that a horrible, uh, w- horrible uh, the way to be a doctor? When I worked at Bellevue Hospital as an intern resident in internal medicine, the hardest part of death to me as a doctor was 
treating patients who are in the process of dying, often from things like cancer, and not being able to help the patient, not be able to change things, and to participate in the uh, loss of life uh, that can be so upsetting. Uh, treating the patient was much more upsetting to me than seeing the dead body. The dead body has no pain, no suffering, and is there for us to learn something, to help the family know something about the cause of death, to help uh, uh, the uh, police and prosecutor uh, to know what the causes of death were in, in, un in, in unnatural deaths, uh, homicides, suicides, uh, to tell them what the situation is, but not necessarily to agree with them. Um, so uh, death is inevitable, uh, and uh, the problem is as, as we get older, uh, as, as medicine has gotten better, as sanitation has gotten better, as eating has gotten better, everybody is living longer than they used to live. So the benefits of long life as we can see our kids, our family, uh, enjoy things more, but at the same time we get sicker uh, more. There's much hip. Uh, today, I think the most common surgical procedure are uh, 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 curing uh, hip problems due to arthritis and uh, hip uh, uh, surgery. Uh, as we get older, which wasn't it wasn't a problem when we had a long, younger people. Uh, as far as um, um, why I started the, the book, I've, I've thought in the past, uh, since um, uh, I became chief medical examiner and saw how quickly uh, uh, the police get upset if you don't find things in their favor, uh, I've learned uh, that there is a lot, when police deaths occur, there are a lot of pressures on medical examiners to find um, causes of death that are helpful to police that uh, uh, may or may not be valid. And that when um, uh, Floyd died, it was so obvious to me from just the, the video that's shown that this was a typical kind of um, uh, n n compression, uh, asphyxial death for the fact that he was calling out that I can't breathe uh, uh, as Eric Garner called out, I can't breathe, and others, um, that when when uh, Crump called me, even though I was in isolation from COVID, I felt this was an important enough matter to come down and because the the blame was being put on drugs and 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 uh, and uh, heart disease rather than that well, that was painfully obvious to the witnesses who were there saying you're killing him uh you know that uh, and to what was on the video that this was an important case and that this was sort of a culmination of things that I had learned over the previous uh 40 or 40 years or so that uh, often police misjudge what causes of death are when people die in police custody and after uh, in police alterca altercations. So uh, when I returned after the, I thought if I was going to write a book about it, uh, I should, this is the time to do it, this is COVID, that clearly all deaths have to be reported uh, in police action, have to be looked at in police altercations. Uh, and that there has to be some kind of national uh, uh, register uh, that uh, where all deaths in police altercations have to be looked at because often, as uh, Tyree uh, Nichols showed, the police give false information initially as to how the deaths occur, uh, that uh, the um, uh, uh, prosecutors go along with the, what the police say. There's a bias toward police among medical examiners and coroners uh, in their favor. 
and that the families uh, only find out about these things sometimes when eventually a video is released of what really happened, uh, as with uh, the Green case. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, I think it's important and that there's a lot of misinformation now in the media about deaths in police custody, uh, that uh, when we have a case like a, a person beaten up after a car, a car chase and beaten to death, uh, that happened in the Green case, and then uh, it's called on a death certificate uh, uh, automobile accident, there's no way that can be recovered from doing uh, searches on the death certificates or, or looking at police reports. It has to be done independently where all uh, deaths in custody are looked at. There'd be a few thousand deaths a year. This would be something easy to look at, but it would be important to do that so that there'll be some central knowledge of uh, all the deaths occur by shooting as well as by during the restraint process. Uh, and that then uh, strategies can be worked out to prevent the deaths. They, there should never be uh, compression of the neck. Uh, there have to be proper videos. Tyree Nichols show there should be pole, pole videos, videos on pole higher up, so that captures the whole uh, uh, death scene rather than just uh, the body cams that are helpful, but that can be turned off easily uh, uh, by officers, as with uh, Tyree, uh, who don't want things to be shown on video, uh, and that there can be strategies developed to prevent uh, deaths from um, uh, uh, altercations with police caused by police or cleared, cleared that police didn't have anything to do with it, if there's enough uh, documentation of what happened, not relying on the documentation only coming from uh, what the police say happened. Well, thank you so much. This has been an extremely fascinating conversation. I've learned so much just sitting and listening to you speak. Uh, you have done great work, and I love the stance that you've taken early in your career. And I think that if I got this correct, you called it the three-legged stool, where the police, the prosecution, and the medical examiner usually work as one. Uh, and, and you made a decision, look, my job is to get to the truth. No matter, it, it's you guys' job to figure out who did it. I, I'm just telling the truth. And that's what's most important to me. So I thank you so much for for even, you know, not falling victim to a system uh, that really has worked against so many poor and disenfranchised people since the, to, since the beginning of time. So thank you. And, uh, and uh, this is all discussed in the, this book that just came out. Where can we find that book, uh, Dr. Barton? It's, uh, it should be in all bookstores, but it's certainly on Amazon. Uh, Amazon is the easiest way to get it. Okay. American Autopsy. It is a must read. I will be going and get my copy immediately. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Good to talk to you. Likewise.